in this second video, we will establish the equations of a fluid structure interaction problem. Since we are coupling two domains that I hope you have already studied before, we will first do a quick review of the equations in each domain. The notions that will be developed in this video can be found in your solid mechanics courses, in your fluid mechanics courses, but also, since we will very often deal with problem of dynamics of coupled structures, in your structural vibrations course. Let's go for a quick summary, fasten your seatbelt. First of all, here are some conventions and notations that will be used throughout this course. We consider a solid defined by the domain omega s immersed in a fluid defined by the domain omega f. We note d omega the boundary between the two domains. The normal n at this interface is by conventions always directed from the solid to the fluid. In the initial reference configuration, the quantities are indexed by zero. This index is removed when referring to the current configuration. Space and time are denoted by capital X and capital T. In this course, we will use capital letters for dimensional quantities, while their lower case equivalent will be used for all dimensionless quantities. Let's first look at the solid. In order to simplify the presentation, we simply recall here the equations that describe a three-dimensional solid in the framework of linear isotropic elasticity. The solid is described by three parameters, the Lamé coefficients lambda and mu, and the density rho s. As the solid deforms, its boundary changes from d omega naught in the reference configuration to d omega in the current configuration, and the normal to this interface follows this transformation. The field variables are the displacement vector xi, here capitalized because it is a dimensional quantity in meters, and the stress tensor sigma, again capitalized. It is expressed in Pascal. The fundamental equation governing the dynamics of an elementary particle of the solid is written as follows. The first term is the acceleration of this particle. The second term is an external volumic force, here due to gravity. And the last term comes from the internal stresses in the material. To this equilibrium equation, we must add a relationship for the behavior that links the stress in the material to its deformation. In the framework of isotropic linear elasticity, the stress tensor depends on the strain tensor, which is itself expressed as a function of the displacement field in the assumption of small strains. By introducing the expression of epsilon in the expression of sigma, then doing the same for sigma in the equilibrium equation, we obtain the Navier equation, which describes the dynamics of a three-dimensional elastic solid under the small deformation hypothesis. Finally, we must add boundary conditions to this equation, which will depend on the stresses or displacements imposed on the interface of the solid. I want to emphasize that in this course, we will never use this equation. Instead, we will use a simplified version according to the geometries or even a modal description of the solid. This is what we will discuss now. First of all, let us note that in the Navier equation, three main categories of terms can be highlighted. First, there is the inertia term, two terms proportional to the displacement, which are stiffness term, and finally, an external voluming force. Let us put this equation in a generic form, which shows a mass operator, a stiffness operator, and an external forcing. This form is not specific to the Navier equation. It can be found in the string or beam equations, the membrane or plate equations, and many other simplified equations describing the dynamics of solid with specific geometries. Without closing generality, let us rewrite this generic equation for a scalar field. For the free problem, which means for f equals zero, we know that the solution can be obtained by looking for solutions in the form with separate variables where the time dependence is harmonic. 
the introduction of this solution into the dynamical equation then gives a problem called the storm uville problem for which there are an infinite number of independent solutions in the form of pairs of eigenfunctions phi n and eigenfrequencies omega n. Here are some examples. After having defined a scalar product between two functions defined on the solid problem as the integral over the domain of the product of these two functions, we know that the eigenfunctions, also called eigenmodes, are orthogonal with respect to the stiffness and mass operators. As a consequence, the solution of the problem is expressed as the sum of eigenmodes, the coefficient of the decomposition being noted q and depending on time. The projection of the equilibrium equation onto an eigenmode i then gives a forced oscillator equation where the mass and stiffness are respectively the modal mass and stiffness of the mode under consideration. And the modal force is the projection of the force onto that mode. Most of the time in this course, we will describe the dynamics of the solid according to these second modes, which will be assumed to be already known. Let us now study the equations in the fluid. The domain is denoted omega f. The fluid in this domain is parameterized by a reference density rho f naught, a reference pressure p naught, a reference velocity u naught, which is generally the velocity of the flow at infinity. And the last parameters are the Lamé coefficients of the fluid. The field variables are the velocity field, the pressure field, and the density field. To describe the fluid dynamics, we will use three equations conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, and a state law. The conservation of mass relates the change in density of the fluid within an infinitesimal control volume to the flow of matter across the boundary of this infinitesimal control volume. To write the momentum conservation equation, we write a balance equation almost identical to the one we introduced for the solid. The only difference comes from the presence of a particle derivative instead of a partial derivative in the inertial term. This is due to the fact that we use an Eulerian description for the fluid attached to a volume, whereas the Lagrangian description is used for the solid and it's attached to the matter of the medium. What will distinguish the fluid is then its behavior. For a classical Newtonian fluid, the stress tensor depends on the pressure and the velocity field. Two viscous terms appear. One is related to the strain rate tensor, the other to the expansion of the fluid through the divergence of the velocity. By introducing the expression of D in the expression of the stress tensor, then the expression of this tensor in the equilibrium equation, we obtain the conservation equation of momentum. Not here that the particle derivative has been developed. It should also be noted that we have not made any assumption of incompressibility of the fluid so far. So the two balance equations are not sufficient to close the problem. To do so, we introduce the simplest possible law allowing us to link the pressure variation to the density variation. It is a proportionality relationship whose coefficient is noted c square. Here are finally the conservation equations in the fluid. The conservation of mass, the conservation of momentum, and the state law. We add to these equations boundary conditions, such as zero velocity on non-moving walls, or velocities or pressures imposed at the entrance and exit of open flows. This set of equations is called the Navier-Stokes equations. Let us now return to the problem coupling the fluid and the solid. In both domains, the equations we have just presented remain valid. Thus, in the solid, we are always dealing with the Navier equations, or with equations taking into account the specificities of the problem. And most of the time, we will be satisfied with the modal description of the solid. In the fluid, we will always deal with the Navier-Stokes equations. 
What will change in our modeling is that the interface between the fluid and the solid. We will introduce two conditions at this interface. The first one consists in considering equal velocity of the fluid and the solid at the interface. This condition is called kinematic condition. The second condition consists in imposing equal stresses at the interface. This is the dynamic condition. The kinematic condition thus writes u equal dixie on dt. And the dynamic condition consists in the continuity of sigma scalar n at the interface. Let us now write these equations in the context of a model solid dynamics. To write the velocity of the solid involved in the kinematic condition, we sum over all the model contributions. Not the point on the model displacement, which consists of a derivative with respect to time, which is a velocity. Finally, the dynamic condition written in the model basis consists in calculating the contribution of the fluid stress to the model force of each mode, which amounts to projecting the fluid stress at the interface on the considered mode. We have now detailed the set of equations used to describe the fluid structure interaction problem. We have seen the equations in the solid, in the fluid, and the two conditions at the interface, the kinematic condition and the dynamic condition. We are dealing with a very complex problem, linking two sets of equations on a moving interface. The next video will be a first step towards the simplification and classifications of this problem. We will deal with the dimensional analysis of the equations.